Yeah. It's good to see you guys. I love having the crowds back here. Yes. We've done this in empty rooms before. Our slow times, we've only got a few guests. Great to have you all with us. It is. Mm -hmm. It's a great time to come down and visit. Um, the weather is just... It's getting so nice now. It's been it's been fantastic. All right, we got a couple things to talk about here uh, before we get into uh, our news items. First thing we want to mention here is um, Answers Bible Curriculum Digital. So if you use our Answers Bible Curriculum for Sunday School, um, we've now launched a digital version of that, a whole digital platform you can use that has all kinds of tools to help you with scheduling and um, uh, with creating classes and all of that. You can find all of that um, at myanswers.com. So really great way to help um, make your Sunday mornings prep and all that go much, much easier. Very user-friendly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you can check that out, uh, myanswers.com. The other thing I want to mention is this, just a couple days ago, I guess now, we had our Answers for Women conference, um, and that was tremendous. Uh, everyone just had such an amazing time. My wife loved um, it. I was there on Friday. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely excellent. Such great teaching. And yep. um, we've announced our next one, which is for 2022, uh, Rooted, Standing Firm in a Twisted World, March 31st through April 2nd, 2022. So um, you can actually already register for that, um, which is exciting. It is. And talking to Georgia just the other day, there's over 500 people all already registered for this conference yes. in 2022. Which is crazy. So <laughs> it was the first thing I had on my calendar for 2022. Yeah. So I'll be speaking as well, talking about oh, evangelism. Nice. That's why they signed up so fast. Um, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of the speakers who are coming, um, obviously, uh, Ken Ham and Dr. Georgia Purdom are both speaking. We have um, yep. Daryl Harrison from the Just Thinking podcast um, and Laura Story. Most of you probably know her from her song, Blessings. Um, she's oh, going to be yeah. giving her testimony as well as doing a concert. And the person... I think personally I'm most excited about is Kyle Mann from the Babylon Bee is coming, which I'm like super <laughs> excited about. Um, when they announced that at the conference, all like all the women in the audience just kind of cheered. They were excited. So that was really cool. So um, be sure to go to answersforwomen.org uh, to, uh, to register All the speakers that. are great. A little shout oh, out yeah. to Daryl Harrelson from the Just Thinking podcast, a tremendous podcast dealing with so many social yeah, issues, really especially good. social justice, critical yeah. race theory, mm -hmm. and those sorts of issues. That's what he's going to be talking really, about. Really, I am really a little bit thing. mad at them though. They're uh, two podcasts guess ago, it was three hours long. I yeah, haven't had that. the heart to tackle it yet, but it's definitely <laughs> on my top list as well. <laughs> All right, so we got our first kind of fun item here before we get into the uh, news. We've got this one from Not The Bee. This lady was adopted as an infant. 50 years later, she found her birth parents, reconnected them, and they just got married. So this story is that just is so cute. That is full circle, right? <laughs> it's so cute. Holy cow. So she was adopted in 1968 uh, just as an infant. And 50 years later, she meets her birth mother and starts to hear kind of some of the story. And then she ends up reconnecting her birth parents. And last year, they got married, which is just the sweetest story ever. <laughs> the thing that really struck me, the uh, pictures we've got here on the front of the article that are posted on online, I had the picture of the lady when she was in high school in a old cheerleader uniform. You can tell it's an old uniform because she has long sleeves on. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then you flip True. the page and you see this picture of her with her mother and mm. she looks just like her mother did in high school. Yeah. I was like, yeah, wait a minute, yeah, that's, that's the same wild. person. <laughs> so something good did come out of 2020, I guess. <laughs> good to hear some good news every now and again, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, all right. Our uh, first real news item here comes from Science Daily. Lightning strikes played a vital role in life's origins on Earth. Uh, so this is referring to the, the old question of the origin of life. How did life first evolve on Earth in the, in the evolutionary worldview? And often um, meteorites are pointed to as an essential part in bringing different, um, different minerals and things that are necessary for life yeah, so to Yeah, so amino Earth. acids and phosphorus mm -hmm. and other things. Mm -hmm. right. And now this, this study is saying actually lightning was just as important as meteorites. Yeah, so the problem here is in the evolutionary story, you have to have chemicals, which are basically rocks, minerals, come together in some type of solution. Darwin referred to it as a warm little pond that may have been struck by lightning. And that's kind of been one of the main models through, uh, through the last 150 years, trying to understand how this naturally happened without any divine guidance. So we have to have phosphorus. It's a very key element in our bodies. If you think about your DNA structure, it's bonded together. All those sugars and those chains, those nitrogenous bases are hooked together by a little a phosphate backbone. And every one of your cells has a phospholipid bilayer around it. And phosphorus is a key ingredient in that. So you can't have life without phosphorus. Sure. But it's bound up in these insoluble minerals in the rocks. And how mm -hmm. does that get into these living systems? 
lightning strikes or meteorites. Now, this idea of lightning strikes providing this through these rock structures that are then called fulgurites that will release that phosphorus into a soluble form that can be used. So now, anywhere there's lightning, we can have life. And just because they found a plausible source for more phosphorus for life doesn't really show us or really make mandated that life formed somehow from just natural processes, correct? Yeah, it, it provides a, a reasonable mechanism within their worldview, yeah. but they're still starting from the assumption that life formed from non-life. Mm -hmm. And we know that violates one of the fundamental laws of nature mm -hmm. that we, we have today. We never see that. So in order to believe that, you have to have faith that that natural right. process could have formed life, even though we have no evidence or no mechanism to fully explain that today. Mm -hmm. All we ever observe is life begetting life, right? Mm -hmm. Life yeah. never comes from non-life, and I joke with people, uh, we've never seen a rock form anything or give birth to anything. If you do, you should run away, right? <laughs> it's not good. Life only comes from life in the mm -hmm. real world. A mm -hmm. very telling statement they, they made here, uh, the problem with meteorites is that when a meteorite crashes to the earth from space, it's very destructive, it's very hot, it's gonna, right. if there was a warm little pool there that the meteorite hit, that warm little pool would not be there anymore. <laughs> There'd be a giant crater, uh, even from a small meteorite. So they had to come up with this mechanism and they say, this is a, that the meteorite is much less likely, or the, I'm sorry, the lightning is much less likely to interfere with the delicate evolutionary pathways in which life could develop. And so, Many people think that this is not part of evolution, and many will say, oh, no, that's not part of evolution, that's a separate thing. Right, but we really have to think of it as chemical evolution has mm -hmm. to happen before biological evolution that's can, right. can take place. Life can't evolve unless life exists, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting, just be alert as you read these sort of articles, just the dogmatic language. Yes, yeah. They so confidently assert their ideas, which is absolute fact, when it's really based on assumptions and guesses within their worldview, even the title, Lightning Strike played a vital role in life's origins on Earth. They say it like they got it on video, right? Just watch this video clip and it proves it, right? Or language as you go through the article. Now researchers, the experts from the University of Leeds have established that lightning strikes were just as significant as meteorites in performing the essential function and allowing life to manifest. It's just very confident language, but it's mm -hmm. all based on their assumptions and it's unproven even within their own worldview. Mm -hmm. All right, this next one here uh, comes from uh, the Columbia College website, actually. Um, this is talking about, obviously, um, coming up on graduations, and they're talking about some of their graduation ceremonies that are going to be taking place. Um, and, you know, at first it's just your normal stuff, you know, different classes, graduating different days, different times, having different ceremonies, whatever. But then you get to their multicultural graduation celebrations, where they have uh, seven different, or sorry, six different um, graduation celebrations for people depending on your ethnicity or other identifying features. <laughs> and I mean, here you just, just see our culture's obsession with just this, this whole idea of identity and making everything about these different identity markers and which group you fall into based on these different things. And well, oh. it's, it's fine to acknowledge the diversity among us. Mm -hmm. we, wanna, sure. we want to acknowledge those things. And as we think about this from a biblical worldview, we can acknowledge that there are different cultural influences mm -hmm. and philosophical influences and all of those things. But what has happened in America and in other Western countries and spreading around the world even, is we've taken that, that specific identity, and we've made it the, the defining part of who we are. Mm -hmm. And if you're not part of my group, you can't understand me. And then it's been um, the whole idea of intersectionality and yes. oppression combined with mm -hmm. critical theory. And it's just become an amazing, it's a morass. It's a mess of, of how are we ever gonna dig out of this? Because the people who are claiming we shouldn't be racist are now forming up groups and dividing into groups to have special celebrations that are just their little group. And they've actually accomplished the exact opposite yeah. of what they think yep. they're doing. It's literally mm -hmm. segregation. The anti-racists are being racist within their mm -hmm. own worldview. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it is important to note that these aren't different graduations, they're different celebrations. Yeah, I've mm -hmm. seen some very misleading headlines yeah. 
And as much as we would, would uh, want to disagree with the way people present things in, in certain ways, we should also not misrepresent per people's ideas. So we want right, to be truthful yeah. in the way mm -hmm. we present these things. But in mm -hmm. case you guys can't read it on the screen, I mean, some of these different separations, you've got the multicultural separation, the natives, the lavenders, the, uh, the Asians, Latinx, blacks. I mean, it's very diversive. Uh, which is really kind of sad on multiple levels. But Avery, you just graduated, right? So you went through this. <laughs> oh, goodness. I graduated a long time ago, back in 2015, <laughs> eons ago. <laughs> now, if you are uh, you wanted to get some resources that would help you think through issues like this, our friends at Wretched Radio and oh, yeah. TV, Todd Friel, they've produced this video that Brian's got over there called Road Trip to, to, to Truth. And it Not is to tooth, a, but to the tooth, truth? To truth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> truth like to truth. Lots of little T's in there. And what it does is they, they have a host who goes around and interviews college students on various campuses, and they talk to them about questions like, how do you, what if, what if I identify as a, as a five foot three Asian woman? Is that okay? And the students will basically say, sure, you be you, that's your truth. And it's really shocking. Mm -hmm. And then they bring in experts on mm -hmm. these different issues. So you've got people uh, like uh, Mike Riccardi and Phil Johnson and Shai Lin and all these people who are going to mm -hmm. address those issues and help you see those things from a biblical worldview. So they do a great job of that. They and do. then um, Dr. Dana Sneed, who works with us here at AIG, she's been yeah. involved in writing a curriculum that goes Go along with it. So mm -hmm. if you're looking for something for your middle schoolers, for your high school, for even college age, uh, people to work through these ideas and think about them. It's an excellent resource for you. And it's really, uh, really well produced. I mean, the quality is really well done. It's very engaging. It'll be great for middle school teens or adults, honestly. Mm -hmm. It's so well done. Yeah. All right. This next one comes from the CBC, so from my home country, Canada. Blood-sucking fish fossils overturn one popular theory about our evolution. So this is our weekly everything you thought you knew throw it away. <laughs> our weekly installment of as the evolutionary world turns. Yes. Right? It, everything yes. changes. <laughs> yeah. So this is looking at the age-old question of what did our first vertebrate ancestors look like? And maybe, according to the evolutionary view, something like what you see on the screen is gorgeous. Look at grandma's face there. So that's <laughs> great, great, great so grandpa. So beautiful. Now, as I taught uh, biology in high school, this was the story that you'd find in every biology textbook, that the, the hagfish and the lamprey were these evolutionary links between the invertebrate and the vertebrate classes of animals. And so there are one of our oldest ancestors, so we can trace our ancestry right back to these creatures. And they go through some very interesting stages in their life cycle, not like a typical fish emerges from an egg and you have a fry with the yolk sac to it. Some lampreys that they found in this, the fossil forms actually mm -hmm. did that, but others form other, they have a larval form that they go through that looks like a little worm that hides in the, in the mud. Just eats algae and just, Yeah, and it's just a filter feeder. And then they go through a metamorphosis into these adults. Where they and look they, really scary. Yeah, <laughs> now this is, looks like something you see on some alien movie yes. or space, space really fantasy does. movie that sucks on the outside of your ship and gets all your power. But this, <laughs> that's what they do. They, they uh, will attach to fish True. and scrape off the scales and then take a blood meal from fish. And so they're a uh, type of parasite that, that live all around the world. We can find these everywhere. One interesting thing that they mentioned in this article where they're talking about, um, they, they, they say here, biologists also believe that the larval or embryonic development of some animals was in some ways a look back through time at their evolution. And then the example they give of that is, human embryos have a tail and gill-like structures around their necks. Which is a statement we hear a lot, but it's simply not true. Well, it's and been taught in textbooks over for a and long over time, and yeah. over again. Mm -hmm. It's that old genetic law: ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Basically, your development as you go through embryonic development that re that goes through again your evolutionary development more or less is what it's saying. Which is not true. Which is not true. And if you look at the embryos, you see these folds in the skin of human embryos. They're mm -hmm. not gillsless. They have nothing to do with breathing, especially underwater. They're just folds in the skin that lead to distinct structures. Yep in the neck of the human. And humans don't have tails. Again, those are parts of the body that are forming in the process of development in mm -hmm. the embryo. Yet still, this This lie just this keeps getting repeated persists. over and over and, and over. It's, it's simply not true. Now, it was, uh, back thinking back again to when I was teaching, this idea was kind of being discredited for a time, but it's really been revived. Yeah. And there have been different types of DNA analysis that they tried to corroborate this with. And mm. so it's, it's really this idea that seems like it won't die. 
But yeah. these, these um, the ancestors of these things are little creatures called lancelets that don't have a defined backbone. They have what we call a notochord that doesn't have that clear structure around it, um, either bone or cartilage. And they look a lot like, the fossilized forms that we find look a lot like a lamprey. And so that was the assumption that these went through this stage. So as they've now identified more and more of these fossils that are the baby lamprey, basically, they found some that look like the worm form, the amicetes, and then they found others that look more like a fish fry, where they would have a little yolk sac attached to them for a while. And so they're saying, well, this rewrites that branch of the evolutionary tree. They mm -hmm. must have had a common ancestor, and there are two different varieties of lampreys in the way that they reproduce. That sounds like... God made an amazing variety of creatures that reproduce yep. <laughs> in an amazing variety of ways. So we can yeah. still look at these things from a biblical perspective, mm -hmm. and we don't have to assume that our evolutionary or our ancestral tree has changed because God created man very distinct from all the animals. Now, they still mm -hmm. think a lamprey is our ancestor, correct? They still believe that, but now, uh, I've so that's some, still your great I've got some relatives who I might classify as blood-sucking parasites, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't think... Ouch, <laughs> wow. ouch. Send all your emails, too. <laughs> Uh, I love the last paragraph that says this. It's not, exactly, it's not exactly often that just a single set of tiny fossils completely just overturn the accepted scenario of vertebrate evolution. As your white shrewd would say, false. Like, this happens all, we hear the, all the time. time. There's all a new the fossil. Time. Redefines evolution mm -hmm. happens all the time. All right, Matthew commenting here, back to uh, here comment about as the world turns. He says we should turn this into a soap opera show. <laughs> It's like, it's like a cultural soap opera. It That's what we're going is. over right it now. Yes. <laughs> All right, this next one comes from National Review. Scientists succeed in creating mouse artificial wombs. So in a scientific first, scientists in Israel have gestated mouse embryos to about halfway through their development outside of the womb of a mouse. Um, and nothing could possibly go wrong with this, right? No. So if you think oh. of the, the idea of a, uh, we've popularized the term of a test tube baby, yep. that doesn't mean that the baby grows inside of the test tube. What happens there is the egg and the sperm are introduced together in vitro, in glass, is the Latin phrase there. And so that in vitro fertilization then must be implanted into mm -hmm. a living uh, either a human or a mouse or a cat or a cow, whatever you do. This is a common practice in cattle breeding. Uh, my right. family's a ranching family. And this is a common practice where we'll take these embryos and we'll implant them into different cattle. And, and so what we think about here is a really big step yeah. because sure, here we don't have to transfer it wounds. into another living organism where mm -hmm. it can grow inside the womb. They've actually created an artificial womb that allowed them to get to a certain point of development. Mm -hmm. Now, this isn't to the fully formed It was about halfway yet. through. Mm -hmm. And they said they were totally normal. They looked just like mouse embryos should look at that stage of development. Um, so like you said, this is a huge development in, in science. And I think it has, like all technology, it has right. potentially good applications and potentially very bad applications. Good applications could be, as this technology develops, maybe we can start saving preemies at younger and younger and younger ages, right. right? If we can create artificial wombs, things like that. That's some great application to save lives. But then you have the other side of the coin, which is sadly in our current culture, probably where it's gonna lead to, which is using this technology to be able to grow human embryos for experimentation. I mean, they're already doing that. This would allow them to grow them even further yeah. and wouldn't yeah. be surprising so the article, if they continue to do yeah, that. Yeah, the article asks a yeah. bunch of those questions and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm gonna pose this one to you, Brian. Sure. Okay, see if you're ready for this. Okay. Should this research ever be done in human beings? And let me say this before I answer. And that is sometimes these questions seem really complicated. Mm -hmm. But guys, if we will just start with a biblical worldview, the answers really are not that hard. If you just start from God's word, the short answer is no. The, it goes on to say this after the question Roger read, developing this technology in human beings would require experimentation on living embryos and fetuses. Now, from a biblical worldview, an embryo is a human being. Human being. A fetus baby. is a baby. Mm -hmm. So just replace the word. Developing this technology in human beings would require experimentation on living babies. Yep. All of a sudden, the answer is Very really, clear. really mm -hmm. clear. Yeah. So, so would we do this on a nine-month-old child? 
Atala. What's the difference Atala. from a biblical worldview? We mm -hmm. have to see those things as truly equal. Mm -hmm. They mentioned in the article here something else that's been in the news recently, um, which is scientists wanting to get rid of the. There, there's this 14 day rule. It's been around for about 40 years or so, where oh, yeah. embryo, human embryos that are created in petri dishes or whatever aren't allowed to grow past 14 days. So basically, scientists will create human embryos, do experiments on them, and then kill them at 14 days. And some scientists are trying to get rid of that rule because now the technology allows us to grow them past 14 days. So, I mean, 14 days. Is, is arbitrary, right? Like if you can end it life here, why not take Move it a little, bit further? a little bit further? If life is just a commodity that we can create and destroy and experiment on it on our whim, where where do you stop, right? It's just yeah. it's arbitrary. So some scientists are trying to get rid of that rule so they can continue to do more experiments on older and older and older um, babies. So if you think about this, like they, they're creating a human being made in the image of God, experimenting on that human being and then destroying, killing that human being. It's, it's really horrifying when you look at it through the lens of... Yeah. And we know from view. watching Star Wars what happens when we create lots of clones. We get the stormtroopers and they That's try right. to take away. <laughs> now, no worry. They can't hit you with their laser blaster. <laughs> They'll miss every time, but... They're but, still there. Yeah, that's the, that's the potential. When I read this, that was mm -hmm. the image that came sure. to my mind. There's a scene where they're on the planet Camino and they've got all the little uh, developing babies inside these tubes and they're, they're collecting them and growing up this clone army. Yeah. And it's, those are type of, types of thoughts that should lead us to dystopia. This isn't right. Mm -hmm. This isn't mm -hmm. where we should be going. Right. Mm -hmm. And a warning to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they mention that as the article goes on. They talk about, you know, growing these, these fetuses for an experimentation or organ harvesting, perhaps, of clones. So this idea, well, we would have free access to different organs to be able to do organ transplants and things like that. And it's just, it's just absolutely horrifying. But this is the way that, the, that research is going to go because you have all these, most of these researchers operating through the lens of an evolutionary worldview where we're just animals, so... Why not we do research That's on mice? Right. Why not do research on humans? Like what, what's really the difference in an evolutionary worldview and if the ends justify the means? And That's often right. they'll come up with really good reasons for why they want to do this. Oh, we want to be able to cure different diseases and things like that. Well, you're, you're killing human beings in an attempt to save the lives of other human beings. Like we should not be That's doing that. That's a cost that. we shouldn't wrong. be calculating. Yes, right. exactly, exactly. Well, it's a cost we don't have a, uh, have a right to even have try right to pay. To. Yeah. Right? Life in, doesn't belong to us. God is the author of life and he is the one who decides when death occurs, not us. Mm -hmm. That is in his hands. And so we're trying to take something, we're trying to take jurisdiction away mm -hmm. from God. Yeah. It's not ours. Each of those babies is created fearfully and wonderfully in the very image of God. And the scientists might not think of it that way. They might think mm -hmm. they created life, but no, God, God is the one who creates life fearfully and wonderfully made. By the way, Roger, I just wanted to tell you that Roger from Oklahoma says hi to all of us and God bless. Fellow Roger. Roger, Roger. Roger, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This next one here um, comes from Science Alert. Ancient plants buried a mile under Greenland's ice are a grim warning from the past. So this is talking about the Greenland ice sheets, which uh, this article says, you know, they... they Scientists believe they were extensive as early as 45 million years ago, but maybe not because of some new research that, that um, they've just been doing. So they looked at these um, ancient, they believe they're ancient, um, ice cores that they um, got about in 1966. So these, these cores have been around for a while, but apparently they were kind of chopped up and put in cookie jars of all places and then put that's, in the freezer. That's typically what I do with my samples. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you yeah, yeah. Put it in a cookie jar and stick it in the freezer. I finished these. <laughs> I need somewhere to put this ice core. Uh, here we go. And then they've just been kind of like shipped around to different cold storage places. And then these scientists were kind of like cleaning out a freezer and trying to move some stuff around. They're like, oh, there's these ice cores. They came from this military base in Greenland. In 1966. <laughs> and then they looked at them. They're like, oh, they have some sediment in them. Let's look at them. Well, the sediment wasn't just sediment. You can see in the image there, there's leaves, there's um, twigs, there are all kinds of different um, plant material in these ice cores. So the scientists are like, oh, well, this means that there must have been plant life on Greenland. The, the ice sheets must have all melted so that plant life could grow. A whole forest potentially th was thriving. And then the ice cores built up again. And in an evolutionary worldview, in their long ages view, this is kind of challenging and tricky and how do you fit this in? When you start with a biblical worldview and you understand the flood and the ice age, it makes more sense. Mm -hmm. So I want to read a little bit of an extended quote here from one of the, the authors of the study. It says, our study shows that Greenland is much more sensitive to natural climate warming than we used to think. Mm -hmm. And we already know that humanity's out of control warming of the planet hugely exceeds the natural rate. But wait a minute, let's stop and think about what he's saying. I assume this person is a naturalist. He believes that the world came about through natural processes. Mm -hmm. All that exists is nature. So doesn't that mean that humans are a part of nature because we evolved right alongside all the other animals and plants on the planet? 
So if humans are a part mm -hmm. of nature, how can things that human cause be unnatural or hugely exceeding the just natural, a natural rate? Process, it, right? We're just part of the natural process. With yeah. the so view. even within their mm -hmm. own worldview, they run into these conflicts that if they would stop and think about it, they don't make sense. And many evolutionists, and especially those in the environmental movement, think of humans as more of a virus that's infecting the planet mm -hmm. than as the creatures of God right. that we are placed here on the earth to be stewards of it. Well, something we point out quite often is that every non-biblical worldview will ultimately blow itself up by its own ideas and its own standard. They're mm -hmm. inconsistent inherently. You'll find that eventually. We find it here in numerous ways. And it's interesting. They're actually complaining that, okay, the ice sheet uh, has been here. It's, it's come and gone numerous times, and it, it may melt away again. If it melts away again, then the ocean levels may rise by seven meters across the globe, destroying a lot of the globe. But if it melts away, that reveals a lot of land for Greenland to have more grass and more plants and trees growing. Mm -hmm. That's an, actually the growing of life. Shouldn't that be a good thing in their worldview? And even in their worldview, humans, again, they're the... They're the virus. They're messing up humanity. So if the ocean waters rise and destroy New York or whatever, that should be a good thing, right, in their secular worldview. But again, they're inherently inconsistent mm -hmm. because they have to be. Every non-biblical worldview does blow itself up. Mm -hmm. So looking at the, the ice sheets and how, and how in their view they're thinking that they're growing and then shrinking and growing and shrinking and they don't quite know how to fit this in, how does the, the biblical model of the flood and the ice age help explain what they're seeing here? Well, if we think about, this one's a little bit interesting and it would take a little bit more study than what I've just briefly read here, but it's, it's a layer that's shown up in the middle of this ice sheet, and how would we, how would we get a little environment? I think they said it was about 14 uh, meters thick, the sediment layer. So how do we get a, a layer like this in the middle of an ice age? Well, one thing that happens is we think about our biblical model of the ice age, which happens after the <laughs> flood as a result of the planet's climate settling down and, and settling into place. We would have had lots of windstorms and things, and we actually find evidence of that. We call it aeolian sediment, and a lot of the, the mastodons and mammoths that we find are actually buried in these giant dust piles. So this could have been a product of one of those giant windstorms that deposited this layer. Um, there could have been then plants growing in that layer, and then uh, advancing cooling period that brought another layer of ice. I mean, that's just a, a scenario that kind of makes sense from that perspective, but we would have to study this from the biblical creation perspective right. and try to understand it as well. But we're gonna apply the same basic scientific techniques, but start from a different starting point and understanding mm -hmm. of the history. Same evidence, mm -hmm. two different starting points, two different interpretations mm -hmm. of the same evidence. By the way, they make one statement in the article that what they have found in this core shakes their preconceptions to their core. <laughs> So again, like their whole worldview has yeah. been revolutionized. I, I by would pick a different foundation if my foundation got shaken to the core every time an article comes out. <laughs> that <laughs> might be a good idea. Right? Maybe the word of God doesn't does never move. Okay. By, by the way, real quick, Roger from Oklahoma says this all just proves that sometime in the past Greenland was green. Exactly, and that's why it has there its name. <laughs> Roger that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, this next one. Very shocking. Very, very shocking. All right, everyone prepare yourselves. Neanderthals helped create early human art, researcher says. So wait, wait a minute. You mean humans did human things? It's, it's shocking, I know, but that's what it says. <laughs> So this is talking about um, different, what they call in the article, human types, human varieties, Neanderthals, um, Denisovans, and Homo sapiens, modern humans, um, all living on the earth about the same time, 50,000 years ago, and trading ideas. And because they traded ideas with one another, different groups started doing different things like using pigmentation and making jewelry um, and things like that. So humans doing human things. So they got together, had a party, talked to each other, got new ideas, and then did stuff. Or they were, they were all That's human and they all descended from Babel. And so they already had these ideas because they were all together at one point. Yeah. So we think the, the evolutionary story they reference in here, the out of Africa model, mm -hmm. which has an explanation of these highly developed hominids with large brains, which moved out of Africa and then spread out and populated different areas. That's being challenged in a lot of ways by yes. finding these advanced civilizations as mm -hmm. they would think of them in way in the north in, in modern day Russia and in Turkey and all, all these different places through Europe and even down into the Indonesian areas and all of these mm -hmm. sophisticated societies that have seemed to be there at the same time. And we have found that by analyzing the DNA, the little bit that we can extract here, that there's links between these things. So they were, they were having children together. So Neanderthals and Denisovans and Homo sapiens were all 
humans because mm -hmm. they all descendants spread out from Babel, of Noah descendants and his of Adam and through Noah, through yep. Babel, dispersion. So from a mm -hmm. biblical perspective, this is not a surprise to us at all. In fact, we would expect this and this would be confirming evidence that would support our position. And mm -hmm. once again, numerous times through the article, they're basically saying, these new finds are shaking our preconceptions about human evolution. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just kind of this recurrent theme. And I want to read this one little paragraph to you guys because it kind of cracked me up, but it's kind of based in the evolutionary worldview. Uh, they say this, he writes that Earth, during the according to evolutionary thinking, the Earth was a primeval, complicated place 50,000 years ago. To borrow from the words of Tolkien, we should think of it as a veritable middle Earth in terms of diversity of forms of human family that existed at that time. There were five, six, even more different types of humans present in various parts of the world. So it was just like the Lord of the Rings 50,000 years ago. I will be the tall breed of noble elf. <laughs> All right. be the noble elf. I think I'd have to be the dwarves probably. Uh, yeah. Maybe the hobbits. <laughs> sure, the hobbits, maybe, yeah. Yeah, my, maybe, you have big hairy hobbit. feet. That'd be kind of weird. <laughs> right? Just saying. My feet are safely under the desk, so we're she not going to She doesn't have a beard. You don't have a beard, so <laughs> you can't true. be a dwarf. You That's can't true. I can't be a dwarf. Because, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I guess I'm a hobbit then. <laughs> All right. This next one comes from Not the Beat. Elite private school in New York City bans the terms mom and dad, preferring grown-ups and folks, and there's much, much more. Now, so the I really like this idea. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of a, a fun, colloquial guy in my classrooms, and we have workshops here. I just call everybody kids. I just say, yeah. howdy, kids. What's going on? Or and, what's up, guys? And I just, you're all kids well, to me. Guys. You're kids of different ages. And <laughs> my, I, on Unlocking Science, I say it's, it's a science show for kids of all ages. So I, I'm go. pretty good with it. Let's just go with kids for everybody. Just kids for everybody? And by the way, this private school is only $50,000 a year. So it's if only $46,000 a year. I was don't they don't exaggerate. I mean, come on. Only $46,000 46 a year. A year? Holy cow. I cannot imagine. Um, it's in Manhattan. It's called Grace a Church School. I believe it's an Episcopal uh, school. And they have, so they, they introduced this new Grace Inclusive Language Guide, um, which is supposed to help parents, students, um, and teachers to understand how to, you know, use gender inclusive language so that they can provide critical affirmation to students across the gender spectrum, uh, as well as other things that they go on to list. And some of those, so instead of saying boys and girls to your students, you're supposed to say people, folks, friends, readers, or mathematicians are some of the examples that yeah. they give. And if you're from New Jersey and you say use guys, that's totally <laughs> offensive because <laughs> we're not all guys. So what if you're from the South and somewhere. you say you all? All y'all, right? All y'all. <laughs> I think that works. That's pretty, pretty inclusive of everybody. It's inclusive. There you you go. can't say mom or dad either. That is offensive. Mm -hmm. Although You're it's kind of funny. They say you can't use those words, mom and dad. And then in one of their videos, where they're talking about uh, so-called gay families. You have them talking about kids having two moms and two. Death. They can't even be consistent within their own guide because you, you have to use words that actually mean things to describe things. So they can't be consistent because this kind of language just doesn't work. For some reason, they don't like babysitter either. I don't, I don't know what the, I guess it's insulting calling people babies. I don't know. They don't want you yeah. to use babysitter either. They want you to use caregiver. But the I, whole, I thought we should name women maternal progenitor if she's actually that we could just teach kids to call that that's what i call my mom progenitor. all the time she loves it <laughs> <laughs> no it's gestating parent remember we discussed okay. that a couple weeks that ago that was another article yeah um the one, the one i thought was really uh -huh. strange on the list was when you're reading a book instead of saying the boy or girl on the page you're supposed to say the child or the person or the character it's like but the book tells you whether it's a right. boy or a girl and uses pronouns you don't have to guess what they are it's right in the book so that that doesn't i think it's kind of telling like me, the but. whole goal is to not offend a particular group mm -hmm. of people. And of course, they would say not to offend anybody, but in one of their videos, they have a young girl taking God's name in vain right off the bat in the teaching of their new guide. And so taking God's name in vain is offensive to a whole lot of people. Mm -hmm. Seems like they don't want to offend a particular group of people, mm -hmm. not all people. And, and you see their worldview yeah. really shining yeah. through. And the foolishness of what happens when you abandon the truth of God's word and you're yeah. left with human ideas that are just And I think this, this kind of sums it up. The author says, I can think of no more valuable lesson to teach our kids than instilling in them a sense of entitlement and the expectation that the world is obligated to bend over backwards to accommodate their every whim and desire. That's right. And that's what we're doing when we're training them to be offended if somebody assumes you're a girl when you look like a female. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right. Well, that is all the time that we have for today. We're out of time, but we'll be back again on Monday. Um, so until then, have a great week. God bless. God bless. See you guys. Thank you. What a blessing. Folks, it's a blessing having you here also. Um, if um,